Yes. Very good. So the spotlight speaker will be Christoph Onok. You know, he has done a lot of great work on sublinear algorithms, property testing, streaming algorithms, etc. And today he will tell us about the landscape of massively parallel computation. Christoph, please go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, it is my great pleasure to, to be speaking, Wola. Uh, it's, uh, it's awesome that it's happening despite, uh, you know, the circumstances. And uh, uh, I have uh, really enjoyed the talk so far. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to find out what other people are doing uh, uh, these days, despite the lockdown. So uh, this talk is going to be about uh, massively uh, parallel algorithms. Right? So let me start with a quick uh, historic background where, uh, where this uh, all is coming from. Uh, so in practice, for quite a while, people have been uh, uh, faced uh, with the following situation. You know, they collect lots of data, and this data uh, doesn't fit anymore onto like a regular commodity hardware they might have on a single computer, right? So, uh, so what do you do then, right? And uh, uh, people have realized that this is a problem, and uh, lots of systems have been developed to address exactly this issue. Right, most like uh, the, the most uh, popular one is MapReduce. Uh, uh, there have been other popular uh, follow ups, uh, just to mention Hadoop and Spark. And the nice feature uh, about of all those systems is that you can deploy them on uh, a cluster of uh, regular computers. You don't need, uh, you don't have to buy a supercomputer in order to, uh, to process uh, data uh, using one of those systems. On the other hand, uh, this poses new challenges, right? Because uh, the data is no longer in a single place. Uh, so, uh, so you have to figure out uh, how to organize communication between, between machines that are involved uh, in processing the data, right? Uh, you, you have to uh, figure out how to make sure they don't exchange too much information, they don't do it too often. Uh, the whole protocol, uh, the whole algorithm that is running on this cluster is, is not too adaptive because that, uh, that could lead to uh, uh, significantly, uh, to st significant slowdowns. So, um, of course, as a theoretician, uh, you might ask, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, how, how should I think about those systems, right? Like, uh, uh, what is the proper way of uh, modeling what's happening in them? Uh, so, to address this specific issue, people have introduced the massively parallel computation model, which, uh, which I'm going to describe now. Uh, so in this model, we have a number of machines, let's say capital M, and each machine has uh, the same amount of uh, local space uh, S. Uh, so the input uh, to, uh, to the system is going to be a set of items. In our case, uh, in our case uh, those items are, uh, are edges. Uh, and uh, initially, each machine is going to receive its share of, of, of the edges. And then uh, the computation is going to proceed in rounds. So, so, so in this picture, everything, uh, the time goes from left to right, right? Initially, the first, uh, the machines receive the, the input data. Then in each round, they're going to do some, perform some local computation on the data they have. And at the end of each round, they're going to send messages uh, uh, to, to other machines. Uh, so there is one uh, limitation uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, data exchange phase. Uh, so uh, each machine can only send and receive at most uh, basically its local space uh, uh, overall, right? So the total level of messages that the machine sends or receives is, is bounded by its local space. And um, so, uh, so this model was introduced by Karlov, uh, Suri, and Vasilvitsky already 10 years ago, and uh, it was specifically designed to, to model what's happening in MapReduce. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to uh, go here into details of, uh, of, uh, of what exactly happens in MapReduce. Uh, let me just say that this is a pretty good uh, description of, of, uh, of what, what you would do in, in practice with synchronous uh, uh, batch jobs. And, um, and, and this, this description, this model pretty well also describes what, what happens in, in, uh, in a number of, of other systems as well. So an important uh, feature of the model, which I haven't mentioned so far, is that you can assume that the space on a single machine is non-trivial, right? So you, you won't have like a bunch of, you know, tiny uh, internet of, uh, um, of things uh, uh, devices, but you're going to have uh, like a regular computers, 
right? And because of that, it's, uh, it's gonna make sense to assume that uh, their number is, for instance, uh, less than the, uh, say, the number of words that each machine has, right? Th th this means that the total, uh, that uh, because the, the input, uh, in our case, it's a set of edges, has to fit onto the entire system, you can assume that uh, uh, the space of a single machine is at least gonna be square root uh, the total number of edges, right? And, and usually it suffices to assume that it's just uh, the local space at least uh, you know, the number of edges to some small constant greater than uh, zero. Um, and one, one, one thing that uh, we want to keep, uh, keep small uh, uh, in our graphing is something that we strive to, to keep uh, bounded is, is the total space. So the total space is simply the local space times the number of machines, right? And uh, so as I already said, we already know we, we have to fit the entire input but uh, we don't want to use uh, too much uh, uh, space overall, uh, too much more space overall uh, beyond that, right? Why? Well, if you are dealing with, with uh, large data sets, then, uh, then we cannot hope to say, to have say quadratic uh, space uh, overall. Uh, I think there is a question. Uh, uh, I think that's about the previous talk, so we can. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Uh, so it's, uh, there's some delay. So um, right, so so we want to keep the total space as 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 low as possible, right? And uh, let's see. And when it comes to specifically graph algorithms, uh, it is it is very useful to uh, parameterize uh, the local space of a single machine as a function of uh, of uh, the number of vertices in the graph. Right, so there are three main, uh, three main regimes that people uh, uh, have considered. So the first one is, uh, is super linear, right? So, so each machine has uh, n, to, n to the uh, some constant uh, uh, plus one uh, space. Then it's near linear, right? So, uh, so it's, uh, it can be slightly sublinear. In most cases, it doesn't really matter if it's you know, slightly super linear or slightly sublinear. Usually algorithms can be adjusted to uh, to make them work, uh, even if the space is slightly sublinear. And uh, finally, uh, there is the, uh, the sublinear regime, right? So, so in this case, we assume that the space of a single machine is the number of vertices to some constant between zero and one, right? And uh, so this is the most interesting, uh, this is the most interesting uh, regime if you are uh, dealing with really large sparse graphs. Uh, because then you can partition the computation across uh, uh, several machines, even though a large number of machines, even though the number of vertices is, 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 uh, is large, right? Because uh, it suffices, because in this specific model, you won't be able to keep, say, that, all that much information about every vertex, right? You, you just uh, will be able to intuitively at least able to uh, keep some information about uh, uh, some small uh, number of vertices. Right, so what is so the main- Christoph, sorry to interrupt. There's a question in the chat box which okay. says, can we have asymmetric local space? Like one of them constant space, the other yeah, square root of them. Yeah, I mean, um, so, uh, you know, up to a log factor, you could just throw away uh, most machines, right? And uh, because uh, you're gonna have different buckets of different, of different sizes, right? So uh, I don't have a very good answer beyond that, but uh, you know, in, mo in most cases, things are within, within some range and, uh, uh, it's usually not a problem in practice, I, I, I suspect, right? And if you have a mix of uh, small space machine and big space machine, so then you have to look at, you know, as, as I'm saying, like how much overall space you have uh, uh, for each uh, memory regime, and then one of them is gonna dominate the other one, right? So most likely uh, you, you're gonna adjust your algorithm to work for, for this specific uh, uh, memory regime. Uh, I see. So, so now it's real questions coming, coming in. That's good to know. Uh, uh, I'm gonna close the chat. Uh, right. So, what is the main goal for this for this research? So, uh, we're gonna uh, uh, try to minimize the number of rounds. This, this is the main things people are focusing on because this requires reshuffling of data. Uh, um, uh, the system has to somehow uh, reroute it to to specific machines. Right. It has to do the whole uh, scheduling of who's gonna do what. And uh, uh, let me just briefly mention that when it comes to classic, more classic uh, types of parallelism, like uh, 
uh, PRAM algorithms, which I'm not going to define what it is right now, or also when it comes to uh, you know, distributed algorithms and models like uh, uh, local or congest uh, or similar models, uh, then usually they can be simulated uh, in this uh, in this in MPC even with, sub with sublinear space uh, uh, with the same number of rounds, right? And uh, the thing is that often those algorithms require at least a logarithmic number of rounds. Uh, so, uh, so what we uh, so what we want to uh, what we want to uh, do is we want to achieve algorithms which are significantly faster, if possible, right? And uh, uh, ideally, we would love to have algorithms that run in a constant number of rounds, but but it seems you know from where, where this research seems to be going that uh, uh, something like poly log log n a number of rounds is is uh, is also something we would like we would love to achieve, and uh, and it seems that for some problems it's it's impossible to to uh, to beat uh, log log n rounds. Right. So what's the top plan? Uh, so uh, there are going to be like four sections. So first, it's going to be the early MPC research. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, superlinear space, what people have been doing for superlinear space. I'm going to mention geometric graphs uh, for which uh, we can uh, do some things very efficiently as well. Uh, then I'm going to talk about more recent, uh, uh, more recent uh, uh, topics uh, such as, uh, I mean, more, more, more recent research about uh, in near linear and sublinear uh, space regime. And uh, then finally, I'm going to discuss two topics uh, which I think uh, are interesting. One is, you know, how the complexity of matchings compares to the complexity of connectivity. And then I'm going to also talk about uh, property testing uh, on MPC, what, what can be uh, done efficiently and some, uh, some interesting questions that are, uh, that are open. Okay, so the early MPC research, uh, well, so it kind of started already with the first paper and there was, uh, there was a number of other follow-up papers. I'm just mentioning two of them here in, uh, on, this, on this slide. And uh, so what happens in this uh, memory regime is that uh, for, for lots of problems, uh, uh, we have constant round algorithms, right? Like uh, if, you, if you give, uh, you know, n to the one plus delta space to each machine, then uh, it often turns out that something like poly one over one over delta uh, number of rounds suffices, or uh, maybe something like log log one over delta even uh, rounds suffice as well. And in particular, I want to mention uh, here a very uh, very nice technique uh, of filtering, uh, which uh, heavily uses the fact that this is super linear space. So basically, what it does, it takes uh, a sample from from uh, the set of unprocessed edges. It puts uh, put them on a single machine, and it, it crucially takes advantage of the fact that uh, the size of the solution is only linear in the number of vertices. So, and we've put significantly more edges on a single machine. So now we can use uh, uh, some smart ideas to uh, eliminate a, a large uh, fraction of, of of edges in order to uh, proceed with the computation. To, to, uh, so. Um, so let me mention uh, uh, briefly two applications of filtering. So the first one is minimum spanning forest, uh, right? Or a minimum spanning tree uh, if, if, you're, if your graph is connected. Uh, so basically the idea is that uh, you can take a set of n to the one plus uh, delta edges and you can reduce it to at most uh, say n or n minus one, right? So, so the idea is that you look at all those edges, right? That uh, uh, they, they all have weights. This, this, uh, this is a case of weighted graphs. So you compute the minimum spanning forest on what you have, and uh, edges that didn't make it, uh, uh, the edges that didn't make it to the minimum uh, spanning forest ca can be discarded, right? It's, uh, it follows from, uh, 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 this thing is known as the red rule. It was introduced by Tarjan, uh, but basically if you have a, a cycle and an edge is the heaviest edge on the cycle, then you can, you can safely throw it away. It's not gonna end up in the minimum spanning uh, forest or tree. Right, and this is basically what happens here. And uh, so how do you take this idea, how do you turn this idea into, into, into an algorithm, right? So basically you're gonna apply, uh, apply it in parallel. Uh, so, uh, so in parallel, you're gonna use uh, multiple machines uh, to reduce the number of edges from uh, n to the, n to the uh, one plus delta to, to n, right? So uh, all those machines are gonna be decreasing, uh, reducing uh, a size of uh, the set of edges that was assigned to them by a factor of n to the delta. So, so then you can repeat the process, right? You eliminate some edges, then 
uh, you do the same thing in the next round and so on, right? You can think of this as a big, uh, uh, big uh, circuit that uh, proceeds in, uh, uh, in the number of rounds, right? So you're gonna be done after one, one over delta rounds. Uh, for maximal matching, so, so here the proof is slightly more complicated, but let me just briefly uh, mention what's happening. So, uh, so uh, initially you're gonna select uh, uh, n to the one plus delta uh, random edges that are still unprocessed. You're gonna find the maximal matching in this set of edges, and you're gonna add it to the solution, right? So this is gonna eliminate some vertices. Uh, and uh, so you can remove from the uh, set of remaining edges, all the edges that are incident uh, uh, to uh, at least uh, one of the vertices that are already matched, right? So here the analysis is slightly more complicated than for the minimum spanning forest, but uh, you can use a counting argument uh, to show that uh, uh, this is going to work in uh, roughly uh, one over delta rounds as well. And uh, in both cases, uh, since then, the complexity has been improved to, to log uh, one over delta, so that there are slightly more efficient algorithms. Now let me mention a second example of uh, uh, early MPC research on, on graphs. Uh, so, so this is for a specific class of graphs, right? It's not arbitrary graphs. Uh, it's, it's graphs in which vertices are points, uh, let's say in one in uh, constant dimensional space, right? So once you have those points, uh, this, they induce a, a full weighted graph, right? Where the weight of an edge is, is the distance between, between the endpoints. And uh, so, um, so in this case, uh, uh, we showed that it's possible to uh, obtain a constant round approximation algorithms, even if the space is sublinear in the number of, of vertices, right? We, uh, uh, so basically, the, the, the main idea is that we showed that uh, the techniques that were initially developed for uh, the traveling salesman problem and uh, are widely used in uh, geometric problems uh, can be applied here. Uh, basically, you can take a random uh, a grid and randomly uh, shift it and put it on top of the set of points, right? And then you can recursively try to solve uh, the problem by first constructing a solution for uh, for smaller subsets and move towards bigger subsets. Uh, and in particular, so so here I mentioned MST and earth mover distance. So for earth mover distance. Uh, uh, it was not known how to uh, how to do this uh, purely recursively. Uh, there were algorithms that were using uh, similar techniques, but they also had to construct uh, uh, augmenting paths that involved several cells. And uh, so this is not something you would be able to do uh, in MPC most likely. So we had to develop new techniques. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, now uh, tell you uh, quickly how the algorithm for minimum spanning tree uh, works. Uh, so, and it's, it's very simple. So if you wanted to implement it, uh, uh, you can do it. Uh, it's been done before. And uh, it, the idea is that if you have points which are very close, then, then it's, it's not a big problem. You can just uh, uh, arbitrarily connect them to each other, right? Because uh, you know that the diameter of the, uh, because you have a lower bound for the diameter of the entire data set and uh, you know the minimum spanning tree is, is at least that. And then you, you proceed recursively. So, so for every subcell, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you want to compute some uh, good covering of, uh, of, all the, uh, of all the points that are within this subcell and, uh, and also some uh, induced components on those, on those points. And uh, then uh, the recursive step is, is relatively simple. So it, it follows uh, uh, more or less what happens in uh, in a Kruskal's algorithm, right? So, so, you, so you take a number of cells together, then you search for two closest clusters, you connect them, uh, you turn them into a single cluster, and you keep going until uh, this, the, the length of uh, the distance between two closest clusters becomes large, right? So at this point you stop, uh, there, there is some threshold which you have to stop, otherwise uh, those local connections that you would make with inside the cell could, could lead to uh, an, uh, uh, in optimal solution overall. So, so you want to avoid that. And so you want to pass the information about those, uh, those components you computed. So again, you sparsify, you sparsify the set of points, but you keep the information about who's connected to who, and you keep going, right? So uh, it's possible to show that uh, basically uh, uh, what you get this way is uh, the solution you get is, is uh, essential, is a, is a good approximation to the optimum, 
is going to be one plus epsilon times the number of levels, uh, where epsilon is like this parameter that you can uh, adjust. And uh, so, uh, so you're going to connect not just the way I showed it here, like, you know, pairs of, pairs of uh, basically four, uh, this, this is for the planar case, you don't connect just four cells, you connect a larger number of cells. You take n to some small constant uh, times n to the, uh, some, the same small constant uh, cells, and you put them together. How many of them can you put together? It all depends on how much local space you have on, the, on each machine, right? But you can always uh, proceed uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, non-trivially, so, so you're gonna be done after a constant number of, of rounds. So then you only have to adjust the epsilon to, in order to uh, you know, take care of uh, the, num the actual number of levels that you're obtaining. Right, so, so, so this was uh, the state of things in, in 2014, essentially, right? And uh, it was a very natural question, you know, are there efficient algorithms for, for general graphs, like if the space is near linear or sublinear per machine, right? And uh, I remember, you know, after we wrote this paper with uh, geometric graphs, I remember thinking, you know, that most likely it's not possible, right? Because, uh, or at least it's not, I mean, didn't seem, seem obvious if anything interesting can be done because uh, all the techniques we had, like really very heavily, relied on the fact that uh, uh, you could assign a, a large number of edges to, to significantly super linear number of edges to, to a single machine, right? And if you look at those techniques, what happens when you try to decrease the space to linear uh, in, in the number of vertices, then suddenly their complexity jumps up to at least uh, logarithmic. And um, Right, so, uh, so, so, so what can we do uh, with uh, near linear and sublinear space, it turns out. So, so this project took uh, quite a while. Uh, mm, it was like multiple years in making, uh, uh, but uh, we're gonna focus now on matchings again. So, uh, so just to remind everyone, we want to find a set of edges uh, uh, that are uh, vertex disjoint and their cardinality is as large as possible. Right, so here I'm just going to focus on uh, approximate, uh, getting a constant factor approximation. There are there are ways to uh, turn it into into better algorithms. Right, so um, so uh, what's the round complexity? So what was the round of complexity of of uh, known round complexity of matchings uh, in say 2017 around 2017? So so. Um, so for super linear space per machine, I already showed you how, how to compute uh, uh, something in a logarithmic, uh, in a, so in a constant number of rounds, right? And then if you look at uh, linear or uh, sublinear space, then the best thing we, we knew how to do was to take one of the classic algorithms for maximal independent set or maximal matching and, and simulate it, uh, and simulate it in, in MPC, right? Because uh, because of those algorithms uh, required a logarithmic number of rounds, this, this led to uh, algorithms that, uh, MPC algorithms that also used a logarithmic number of rounds, right? And um, there was this natural logarithmic barrier, right? It was very interesting, you know, if, if it could be, uh, if, if there are better algorithms than that. Right, so, so first, uh, so first uh, we showed that, uh, uh, you know, the number of people uh, that, uh, um, it's possible in near linear memory regime to, to obtain log log n square uh, round algorithms, right? And uh, then there was like uh, quite, quite a bit of follow-up, uh, 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 lots of papers that showed that uh, how to improve this complexity to uh, log log n, right? And in particular, very recent, recently, they, it was even shown how to how to get it for a maximal matching, which, which seemed uh, way more challenging than just getting a constant factor approximation. And um, uh, so what happens for a sublinear space per machine? Uh, so, uh, uh, so it was shown that uh, uh, it can also be, the complexity can also be improved. So we can get uh, roughly square root of log n rounds, uh, right, for sublinear space. And uh, in, in, in particular, Moxen and uh, Jarawito showed that you know this, this applies to like a wide uh, range of range of problems. Right. So uh, so let me briefly uh, say uh, how how these things uh, uh, how these algorithms work. Uh, so so the main idea is that uh, uh, at least one way to obtain them is is to take. Uh, 
a PRAM or distributed algorithm and uh, compress several rounds of this algorithm into much fewer rounds of, uh, of MPC. So, uh, so for instance, for matchings, uh, uh, what you can do is uh, uh, you, you can take uh, one of those, uh, uh, one of those uh, algorithms and for uh, the linear space regime, uh, you can emulate, so, so this algorithm runs in holographic number of rounds, and you can, uh, so this is kind of idealized version, but you can uh, essentially simulate the first uh, half of the rounds of this algorithm in a constant number of rounds of MPC. Then you end up with uh, a sparser graph, and then you can make only slightly, uh, slightly uh, less uh, progress, so then you simulate uh, log n over four uh, rounds in a constant number of rounds of MPC. Then you do the same thing with uh, you know, one eighth of the rounds and so on, right? So, so in the linear memory regime, this idealized simulation leads to log log n rounds of MPC, right? And uh, so one challenge with, with all those algorithms is ensuring some global consistency of those local decisions, right? Because uh, you're going to simulate, uh, simulate several rounds of, of the same uh, uh, distributed algorithm, PRAM algorithm in, uh, on different machines and making sure that uh, decisions they make uh, um, combine into a correct solution is, uh, is, 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 is a problem. And so uh, one important feature of all those things is, is, is uh, that they use a sparsification of the input graph in one way or another, right? So, um, so this algorithm, uh, so, 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 this, so this is kind of folklore. Uh, I'm, I'm here referring on the previous slide to the algorithm that I developed with Ronit for some specific application, but uh, basically, you can do the following. You can first uh, match vertices of degree at least n over two, and uh, you know throw away those that were not matched if you don't care about the maximum matching. And then you look at the residual graph. Again, you you try to match vertices of, of high degree. Now it's say n over four. Uh, then you do this with n over eight, and so on. Right. So so this takes a logarithmic number of rounds. Uh, uh, the important feature uh, of this is that uh, essentially in order to uh, simulate this algorithm, you only need to know high degree vertices, right? And, and also some sample of their random sample of their neighbors in order to find matches, right? So, so once, you, once, once, once you know that, uh, you can try to uh, uh, construct more efficient and logarithmic uh, uh, algorithms for matchings and, and, and other problems, right? So, uh, so in the near, what happens in the new linear memory regime is that you look at uh, random induced subgraphs, right? Initially, your graph is uh, is is uh, is dense, so you can uh, you can make uh, a significant amount of progress, uh, right? You can you can match uh, multiple levels of of densities. And when it's sublinear, uh, the, the best thing we know currently is just collecting a down sub, down sampled uh, a ball around each vertex, right? And basically, we get square root of log n uh, around complexity because uh, you know this, this is where we are stuck with uh, this process of collecting a ball around each vertex. Uh, so 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 this is uh, so this is briefly like uh, what happens behind the scenes for for those uh, matching algorithms. And I'm gonna switch to two more targeted topics. So, so one is connectivity versus matchings, right? So, uh, so I already mentioned, you know, the complexity of matchings. Uh, so it turns out that connectivity and matchings are have uh, very incomparable uh, uh, complexities, as, as at least as far as we know how to solve them first currently. So in the linear memory regime, I already mentioned that we can do, uh, you can solve it, you can find a large matching and, and log log n rounds. And for connectivity, uh, we know it. Uh, we know how to do it in a constant number of rounds. Uh, this can be achieved by taking some algorithm that was initially developed for uh, um, a, a different distributed model called congested clique. It turns out that this this model is is very closely related to uh, MPC with near linear space. Uh, and uh, in the sublinear memory regime. Uh, we know that matchings uh, can be done in a square root of log n rounds, essentially, and for a connectivity, uh, we are stuck at log n. So uh, you could ask, okay, uh, you know, which, which of those things are optimal, right? And uh, so uh, the answer is, uh, it's complicated, but for connectivity, it seems that uh, the complexity is very well understood, right? And uh, 
so of course, for the new linear uh, memory regime, we can solve it in constant number of rounds. You know, there, there are probably some secondary uh, factor improvements you can do, but like that's uh, not that important right now when it comes to the big picture. And for the sublinear memory regime, uh, we are start, stuck, uh, stuck at log n rounds, and it seems to be happening for a very good reason, right? So in particular, there is this, uh, uh, you know, like when you just think about connectivity, who knows, maybe, maybe there is some smart algorithm, right? Uh, but uh, there is a specific instance that almost uh, is going to make you lose any hope you might have had for, for better algorithms, right? And it's, uh, and it's uh, what, what's, what's in the picture, right? Uh, there's a chat. Uh, okay. Wait, that means. Uh, good. So, uh, so uh, you either have a graph uh, that is an, a cycle, right? The cycle on the vertices or you have two cycles on say n over two vertices, right? And uh, you would love to distinguish uh, which is the case, right? In the first, uh, in the former, of course, the connected graph, in the latter, it's not, right? And, uh, and uh, it seems that, you know, log n is, is essentially the best thing we can do. And uh, uh, like, uh, it's really hard to explore, basically explore what's happening uh, along this cycle in, in, your, in this graph faster than log n rounds, right? And uh, uh, people have tried to develop, you know, various techniques to, that would enable bypassing this, this, uh, this, this barrier, but uh, it hasn't been possible so far. And uh, uh, it seems, if, if I had to make a guess, it seems that mo most likely, you know, th there is a really lower bound here, uh, but unfortunately we don't know how to prove unconditional uh, lower bounds in this case. Uh, so, so that's the status for connectivity. And for uh, matchings, uh, the situation is much less clear, right? So, uh, so it seems that the, the current limits in our algorithms come from, um, to some extent, the sparsification barriers, the, the bar, uh, you know, the limitations of our techniques. Perhaps there are better techniques that can, uh, that can achieve this. And uh, if I had to make a guess, most likely getting a constant uh, number of rounds in the sublinear regime for matchings is not possible. Right. In particular, there's this paper from Fox last year uh, by Moxen, Fabian Kuhn, and Jara Ito, uh, in which they show that uh, approximating maximum matching in uh, uh, sublinear space uh, most likely requires uh, uh, log log n rounds. Right? So, uh, so this is, again, we don't know how to prove unconditional lower bounds, really. And so, so they show that, uh, so, so they show this under two assumptions. So first of all, they assume that this sparse connectivity example, which I showed that uh, comp uh, computing sparse connectivity is hard. And then they also assume that their algorithm is, is component stable, which means that what it computes for, for each component is independent of what happens for, for other components. Right, and, uh, right, and uh, uh, so I'm not gonna go into details of how their proof exactly works, but my intuition is also that, you know, like beating log log n should not be possible because uh, uh, in some sense, for matchings, you have to consider a logarithmic number of density levels. So it means that uh, it seems that you know you have to follow basically paths of length uh, uh, log log of that, right? So and and this is uh, uh, I mean paths of length log logarithmic in n. So and this is really hard to do it faster than in log uh, log the length of the path uh, number of rounds. Uh, but in general, for matchings, you know, uh, it's, it would be great if someone showed some non-trivial, some smart reductions that would show that, for instance, uh, you know, the fact that we are stuck in the minimum regime on uh, log log n rounds, that, you know, th there is a very good reason for that. Uh, that would be really great. And in general, I think that, you know, if there is some breakthrough uh, uh, on this uh, sublinear memory regime in particular, then this would uh, most likely happen uh, if we could develop uh, uh, some better graph exploration techniques, right? It would uh, enable us of, uh, uh, you know, not collecting the entire ball around uh, each vertex in which we are interested, for which we want to find out whether it's matched or not, right? Because this, this is what happens in the current algorithms. I mean, it happens for some those sample graphs, but, but essentially that's what happens, right? So we could have like a smart technique that uh, uh, um, explores only uh, some part of the graph, uh, that would be great, that could lead to uh, a potentially a breakthrough here would lead to a breakthrough in, in those old questions for sublinear time uh, algorithms for, for estimating the size of a matching. 
Right, so uh, the last topic I want to discuss is property testing in MPC. Uh, right, so uh, uh, most likely here, here I don't have to uh, tell people of uh, uh, you know what uh, property testing is, but but basically we want to approximately test some properties. So we want to accept if if, if a graph has a property and we want to reject if it doesn't. Uh, and uh, but uh, we are relaxing it, so we only. Uh, so we want to accept if the graph has a property, but we are only required to reject if it's far from having having the property, right? So um, uh, a, a related question topic to property testing is you know all types of uh, sublinear time approximations, and I was uh, you know going over some old slides and uh, I found this uh, slide from. Uh, uh, from the first uh, Walla, right? Uh, so that was uh, something we were working on even before we uh, turned uh, uh, towards working on matchings, right? So, so, so you can, uh, uh, so you can uh, approximate the weight of the minimum spanning tree very efficiently in, map, in, 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 in MPC, right? And uh, so I'm not gonna go into details, but uh, basically some techniques from Chazelle, uh, Rubinfeld and Trevisan uh, are, uh, can, are very easy to implement in this setting. So once we had this result, which was never published except for some of the slides, uh, that's why I'm showing the slides from the past, uh, we, uh, um, uh, you know, I was very excited. I thought, oh, we're gonna take like lots of, uh, lots of, uh, uh, lots of problems, uh, especially their propensity testing versions, right? We're gonna show amazing algorithms, but you know, like beyond this specific result, we didn't manage to get anything back then. And until uh, very recently, uh, where, um, where, uh, uh, oh, I see there, there is a question. So maybe let me take it after I finish. Uh, uh, right, so, um, so, uh, so one thing that is very useful, one tool that is very useful for property testing on graphs is, is uh, random walks, right? It's a very useful tool for exploring them. And so we show uh, in a paper, so this is a joint work with Wonski, Mitrovic, and Sankowski, we show that uh, it's possible in sublinear memory for undirected graphs uh, compute random walks of length uh, L in a number of rounds, which is logarithmic in, in, in the length of, of those random walks, right? And additionally, it seems to be a real barrier because fast algorithms would allow to, uh, would allow for distinguishing one cycle from two cycles more efficiently as well, right? So, um, right, so uh, what's, uh, what's difficult uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, random walks. Well, you want to build random walks, right? What we are aiming for uh, is, be, is is constructing a, a random walk from every vertex in parallel, right? We want to have random walks from all vertices. And uh, so in general, we would want to construct different, uh, to beat the natural complexity of L, uh, we would like to construct uh, different sections of this random walk independently, right? But the problem is uh, that we don't know uh, like maybe we construct somehow the first half of the random walk, but we don't know where we're gonna be, so we cannot construct. So it's not obvious how to construct the second part of the, our random walk in advance, right? So, so the solution is to use the stationary distribution, right? Because if we st if we start from the stationary distribution on the graph, then we know more or less after a specific number of steps that the distribution of where the random walks are is gonna be very close to the stationary as well, right? With like a proper amount of uh, samples. Uh, so we can uh, so we can uh, slightly oversample because it's not gonna for the second part of the, uh, our random walk, right? And in general, we can do it recursively, like oversample slightly more and more for every step, so that uh, so that there is enough uh, edges and walks uh, uh, for uh, you know farther parts of the random walk in order to continue, right? And uh, we also show how to do this for directed graphs, uh, which is more way more complicated, uh, and page rank. Um, uh, applications to property testing. Well, so so the idea is that uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, show that uh, uh, we can um, uh, do bipartiteness testing, right, in the logarithmic number log log n number of rounds. And the exact bipartiteness testing requires logarithmic number of rounds, uh, unless we can uh, solve sparse connectivity more, more efficiently. Right, so uh, so the initial so so this we we uh, basically follow the same approach as sensor Hillel uh, did for distributed algorithms. Uh, so instead of sampling from a you know square root of n random walks from a from a single vertex and searching for uh, searching for odd cycles there, we can just distribute this 
uh, and uh, do a small number of random walks from from every vertex and, and search for uh, search for um, odd length cycles there. So, so that's possible. Uh, we can al we also show that it's possible to, uh, um, uh, to to have a nice MPC version of testing if a graph is an expander. Uh, so the classic test is again it picks a single vertex and it uh, and it uh, uh, runs a square root and random walks and search and checks the number of collisions um, among those random walks. If the graph is not the expander, then then you know you are very likely to start from a vertex in a small component that is not well connected to, to the rest of the graph. So you're gonna see more collisions, right? And then you will know that the graph is not, uh, uh, not, um, uh, not an expander, right? So, so this also can be done by just running a small number of random walks from, from every vertex and you can show that uh, enough, overall the number of collisions is gonna be much higher for, for a graph that is not an expander. Uh, so let me uh, mention now testing clusterability. So, um, so I follow up work to this work on testing whether a graph is, a, is, is an expander, is uh, testing if a graph is k-clusterable. And uh, uh, again, it's, uh, it can be solved with uh, in query complexity square root of n, but unfortunately it very heavily relies on the fact that the random walks are run from the same, from the same vertex. So, so you could do it, but this would require a significantly more total space. You would have to add a factor of square root of n. So, so the very nice open question is whether this, it, we can improve on this and, uh, and also whether one can compute, the, not just test, but also compute the clustering, right? So you, for a solution to this problem for local computational algorithms, you should check a, a work from Peng this year at Soda. So what are the future challenges, right? So, uh, so there are two, so, uh, so there are two questions which I already mentioned. One is understanding the complexity of matchings. The other one is testing uh, uh, graph clusterability with low total space. But there's also a bigger question when it comes, you know, how this research relates to what people are doing in practice. So with things like Spark and other systems, it seems that uh, there is more and more interest in uh, asynchronous uh, systems, right? So because the computation MPC proceeds in very synchronous rounds, right? So uh, it's a big open question, right? Like how do we model this type of setting theoretically? What is the right model for it? And, uh, you know, like even is it theoretically advantageous, right? Uh, because maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's advantageous for, for, um, uh, for applications that uh, be, uh, beyond the constant for, I mean, for the applications that, uh, you know, the systems people have considered, right? But uh, at the same time, we know how to, we learn how to, how to construct very efficient algorithms that maybe don't suffer from the fact that, that we have to do this uh, synchronization every now and then, right? So, so that's also a great question. And there's lots of topics that I haven't covered here. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to uh, see lots of MPC research and, uh, um, uh, we had, you know, one invited talk yesterday as well. Uh, so I, I talked about MPC at the first wall, right? And, and back then I was wondering, you know, how, how is this even, a local, does it even fit into a local algorithms, uh, uh, algorithms, uh, you know, framework, right? Especially since back then most uh, uh, algorithms for graphs required, you know, a strongly superlinear space. So like if you see such a big chunk of, of your graph, it's not really local algorithms, right? But, but it seems that, you know, uh, what, what has changed over those last four years is that uh, uh, it's very clear that uh, these algorithms are, uh, you know, belong, belong to this workshop. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I think there are some questions from, from the chat already. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Christoph. Mm -hmm. um, so there are three questions. Please just go ahead and answer them. And sure. others, if they have questions, please feel free to write in the chat box. Yes. Uh, what are the characters at the high level of the PNAM algorithms that allow the use of the round compression technique for obtaining asymptotically smaller MPC rounds than the PRAM depth? Um, so that's, uh, that's a good question, which, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not very clear. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, so you can try to come up with some characterization, right? like for some problems it works, for some it doesn't, like for connectivity it doesn't work. Uh, for matchings, it works. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems to be related to like those uh, levers of of, uh, of density, right? That uh, somehow it's possible to do it for matching. But I, I don't have a very precise, you know, that, that's something that, you know, lots of people, are, this is a question that I often get at the end of a talk uh, when I talk about this, those things. But there, there is like, doesn't seem to be like a very nice, uh, um, 
uh, nice characterization, right? So, so you know, feel free to you know uh, maybe find one. That would be great. Um, uh, Sebdech, uh, and the next question is from Sebdech. Uh, the critical path is shorter, shorter when you have more, more memory. For example, for summing a set of numbers, you can sum them in each machine and then sum the result. Uh, that's true. Uh, yeah, I see. So you're saying that uh, basically you could probably avoid maybe some of those uh, intuitions why we cannot do better than something, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so so the, so so uh, I see. So uh, yeah, so for a set, I mean, the nice thing for the set of numbers is that you actually know where things go, right? And and that's how, kind of the problem of the exploration, right? Like if someone gave you a cycle, you know, lined up, things sorted, then you would know what the answer is, right? So um, uh, so it seems, you know, that's just you know coming from me. It seems that uh, uh, this might not be helping with uh, avoiding those, uh, you know, difficult instances. Uh, but overall, I do agree that, you know, maybe there is an amazing algorithm for distinguishing one cycle from two cycles, right? That would actually, so who knows? Um, from Yuka, uh, we don't know how to prove unconditional lower bounds for the MPC model for connectivity, but is there any reasonable model that is similar to a weaker stick version of MPC and which we can or at least should be able to prove uh, such lower bounds? Uh, so I think uh, there were some papers that were making some assumptions about uh, what you can do, right? Like for instance, uh, so I don't know exactly what's the status, but I think like if you assume that you cannot, uh, uh, like uh, for for graphs, right? Like if you assume that your vertex IDs are something you cannot play with, right? It's just like something that you don't have access inside. Like you cannot uh, do say XOR or some random labels to get something else that's, uh, that you know magically gives you the answer. So, um, so it seems that if you assume that, you know, the IDs are kind of an un, 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 uh, immutable object that you cannot do anything with, that most likely in those cases, you can probably prove uh, uh, condi uh, uh, those conditional lower bounds. And uh, uh, I think there was a paper at some point that uh, was making some assumptions of this type and uh, solving uh, things like this. Uh, uh, the next question, uh, also from Sefidek, are there lower bounds based on the diameter uh, of the graph for connectivity uh, in sublinear MPC? Um, a good question. So, um, yeah, maybe there is like a simple reduction you could do to show that log, log, uh, log the diameter suffices. Moxen seems to be saying yes. Uh, uh, yeah, it's probably, it's probably yeah, there true. Is a, there is yeah, such a reduction. Ahead. Good. Uh, so thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, time to switch. So if possible, and Ali mm -hmm. can set up, that would be great. Uh, 